There's been some truly great programmers in video games. Some of them have written games that have defined a new genre. Others, capable of hitting the bare metal of the hardware and extracting the very best performance. And then finally, there's the developer that makes the impossible happen. And Randy Linden falls into that category. Linden was responsible for porting Doom to the Super Nintendo. And if there was a system that had no business running Doom, the Super Nintendo would be it. On July 14th, 2020, the source code for Doom running on the Super NES has been released to the public. And now we can get a glimpse at some of its secrets and some of the interesting ways that Linden was able to get this impossible port to run on the Super NES. For some context, it's important to discuss who Randy Linden is. Initially, he started writing games as far back as the Commodore 64 in the 80s, but he quickly gained attention for porting Dragon's Lair to the Commodore Amiga in 1989. At the time, CD systems weren't a thing, and games ran on floppy disk. Dragon's Lair was ported to just about every home computer system at the time, but the Amiga version stood out. It streamed the game from floppy disks and featured digitized speech and music straight from the arcade, and somehow it all ran on a 7 MHz Amiga computer. But Linden is probably best known for Bleem, the PlayStation 1 emulator for PCs. Bleem was to PS1 emulation that Ultra HLE was for Nintendo 64, the impossible emulator that many thought was fake. But it was anything but. In 1999, you could run PlayStation 1 games on your PC, and Bleem was even sold at retail stores for a short time. Bleem was coded by Linden when he realized a PC could read PS1 discs and was intrigued at the possibility of running PlayStation games on a PC. Written in 100% assembly language, Bleem was easily the best of the early PlayStation 1 emulators. But unfortunately, Sony would file a lawsuit against the company, alleging Bleem was in violation of unfair competition. Bleem would win the court case on all counts, but the lawsuit forced the company out of business. A few years later, Linden would resurface again with a demo of Bleem running on the Sega Dreamcast. It was an independently developed commercial emulator, and in the end, ran just three commercial games on separate discs. Known as Bleemcast, you could run Gran Turismo 3, Tekken 3, and Metal Gear Solid. Bleemcast ran at an upscaled 640x480 resolution, and featured bilinear filtering and anti-aliasing to improve the PlayStation's graphics. But perhaps the most ambitious and technically amazing port Linden has accomplished is Doom for the Super Nintendo. The story of this port is fascinating. Like many of us, Randy was a big fan of Doom, but armed with his expert knowledge of game console hardware and extracting the very best out of them, he set out to bring Doom to Nintendo's 16-bit system. Linden's motivation was simple. Doom was a truly groundbreaking title and I wanted to make it possible for gamers without a PC to play the game too. Doom on the SNES was another one of those programming challenges that I knew could be accomplished. In 1995, Doom was two years old and had been brought to other game systems such as the Atari Jaguar and Sega 32X. Linden was an independent developer and had no access to Doom source code. He started off with a blank sheet of paper and went to work. The first thing he did was understand how assets were loaded from Doom's WAD file. For this, he referenced the unofficial Doom specs by Matthew Fell, which went into detail on all the assets in Doom and how they were extracted and used. But the biggest hurdle would be bringing the EdTech 1 engine to the SNES without any source code. Linden knew that the Super NES hardware alone would not be fast enough to run Doom. The base hardware has a slow processor, a fast PPU that's aimed for 2D games, and although it could do some tricks with Mode 7, Doom lives in a 3D space and its engine relies on mathematical calculations to render its world. And for that, he would need to tap into the update to the Super FX chip that Nintendo originally used in Star Fox. The Super FX2 or GSU2 chip would power Doom and be responsible for much of the mathematical and vertex calculations. The GSU2 ran at 21 MHz RISC architecture and on paper would be up to the task. But setting up a development environment to tap into the Super FX2 chip would also prove difficult. As there was no development kit and very limited information on the chip itself, Linden would have to improvise. He built his own custom development kit toolchain using his Commodore Amiga. Everything from the assembler, linker and debugger. 
he could remotely debug his code via serial and used a modified Star Fox cartridge to develop the game. Linden wrote an entirely new engine for the game, which he named the Reality Engine, that would allow Doom levels to be run on the Super NES. Looking at the source code, it's clear that it bears very little resemblance to the official Doom source code that was written in C. At the time, the larger Super FX ROM was 16 megabits. Linden had to make some sacrifices to squeeze the game into that size cartridge, and by end of development, there was only 16 bytes available. Sacrifices also had to be made to make the game run at an acceptable level of performance. A typical SNES game runs at a resolution of 256 by 224 pixels, and many Super FX games will use a smaller window to compensate for the Super NES's limited bandwidth. Doom shrunk the screen size down to 216 by 176 pixels, and with 32 rows used for the status bar, and because each vertical line is doubled, the native rendering resolution is actually 108 by 144 pixels. Ceiling and floor textures were also removed, but replaced with dithering to simulate depth. The game was also missing levels from the original, some sound effects were cut out, and many sprite animations from the original also got the chop. When Linden released the source code, I was eager to take a closer look at the code and try to answer some long-standing questions. I heard that the game was playable over X-Band, which was the first competitive online multiplayer network released in North America. And my good friend, Wrestling With Gaming, has done a very good video on the X-Band, and I recommend you check it out if you want to learn more about it. But going back to the source code, indeed, X-Band code is present and built into the game. Now, the X-Band source code does exist, and essentially all these XB files are all about the X-Band code. So if we take a look at X-Band init, uh, essentially this is the initialization function for the X-Band stuff. One long-standing question I was hoping to get more answers on is, does the SNES mouse actually work with Doom? If you look at the manual for the game, it actually tells you that the mouse is not supported. And I've heard conflicting stories whether the mouse actually works or whether it doesn't work. And I guess the best way to answer these questions is to take a look at the source code itself. And yes, there are indeed references to mouse X and Y movement and mouse button control. And it appears to be polling inputs right at the same place as the joypads. So I can only assume that it should work. However, when I tested my original copy of Doom with a Hyperkin mouse, unfortunately, mouse support still doesn't seem to work. And it goes on with what the manual is telling me. So I am a little confused about this one. If anyone has any experience in getting mouse control to work on Doom for the SNES, please let me know in the comments below. One discovery I came across is while the engine was known as the Reality Engine, the project name for Doom on the Super NES was known as Rage. This header file contains flags for all the features that are present in the game, which can be turned on and off. One item that some might find interesting is this variable here, which will enable the Super Scope. Now the Super Scope was an add-on peripheral for the Super Nintendo that allowed you to play light gun style games. It was essentially this kind of plastic bazooka type thing and it allowed you to play certain games on the Super NES. There was a six in one game. Metal Combat was another one that took advantage of the Super Scope. So there was some Super Scope specific games out there. There was a Yoshi's game out there as well. And Doom supposedly supported the Super Scope. Now looking closer at this, even though this use scope is set to zero and you know, one will enable Super Scope. I think what I will tell you guys is, is that again, I don't know if, if this is the latest and greatest code or if there's other iterations of the code, but if we do a search for use scope in this project, it's only ever defined in this rage.i. It's never used anywhere else. So that kind of tells me that Super Scope, even though it was something that was considered to be adding into the Doom source, is not something that actually made the final cut. The Reality Engine consisted of very fast assembly language for loading Doom levels, including an optimized BSP algorithm, code for segments, walls, sprites, sound effects, music, and more. And because Doom ran in a 3D world, it meant trigonometric based math, which a slower processor like the Super NES would not be very good at. So to get the very best results when it came to this trigonometric math, he used pre-calculated lookup tables, 
something that was very common in the demo scene. So essentially what we have here is sine, cosine, and tangent tables, I believe, that are all pre-calculated. And the reason for doing this is for speed. If you have a predetermined answer that you know is going to get asked, that is much faster than trying to calculate the sine or cosine, because doing that, again, in a mathematical function on the Super NES can be time consuming from a CPU timing perspective. So having a massive pre-calculated lookup table of just all these values is something that really helps the Super NES version get its speed. But I guess on the flip side of that, when you've got all this kind of data, this kind of global data that's just sitting out there, it eats up your actual overall memory. So one of the reasons why the game barely fit into a 16 megabit cartridge is for reasons like this, where you've just got these massive tables of values that will ultimately give you the answer that you need. But the drawback is, you know, you, you lose space from doing this. One of the most important parts of Doom is the BSP tree. This is the algorithm that renders walls, drawing as it traverses a tree of nodes from front to back. Linden rewrote this into fast assembly language and incorporated it into a cache block for speed. This would be crucial for performance. Also crucial would be the fill rate and DMA of SuperFX rendering over to the SNES. Many other parts of the Reality Engine were also optimized and cached, but even with all these optimizations, Doom on the Super NES, while technically impressive, can get sluggish at times, running at an average of about 10 frames per second. In general, limitations of bandwidth, fill rates, and the low clock speed of the Super NES main processor are the main culprits. I think it's fair to say that this code has been pushed about as far as it can. Many people were disappointed that Doom on the Super NES ran at a sluggish frame rate and looked blocky but I think that's missing the point. Incidentally, running the game with a slight overclock under emulation does improve frame rates quite significantly. Perhaps with a little more clock speed or bandwidth on the hardware, then we may have seen some better results. As for the future, it remains to be seen what we'll see of this source code. For me, it's simple, however. Impossible ports deserve to have their work preserved forever, so it can be studied and understood. And there's already been some recent updates in the ROM hacking scene. The long-standing circle strafe issue that was found on the Super NES version of Doom has been patched recently. This means that the control system on the game is much improved, and it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested. For me, it's the biggest gripe of this particular version. So I'm very happy to see a patch has already been released. And with the source code release, maybe we will finally get that Super Scope support edition we've been hearing about for all these years. Well guys, that will do it for this video. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.